Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 12, titled Down for the Count, Part 1. This is going to be a rough episode. We knew this episode was coming, and it's still going to be a sad episode. Yes, it's very (laughs) sad. It originally premiered on January 9th, 1987. So here we are, 1987. Jumping in. The episode is directed by Richard Compton, who will direct both parts of this episode. This part one, next week will be part two. They actually aired them as two separate episodes. It's not like the other ones where they aired them in back-to-back episodes. This took place over two separate weeks. You mean part two wasn't like five episodes ahead? Or ended up <laughs> yeah, somehow no. in season this five. This was actually in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> it was written by Dick Wolf. This was a very important story. Got the boss writing it. Before we get started, I could check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, this is a weird time. Remember way back in 2016 when clowns were roaming the streets causing problems? Well, it's that time because mm-hmm. Stephen King's It has hit the theaters. And I know we're an 80s podcast. This is close enough. The original It aired in 1990. See, of the three of us, I think this story is a bigger deal to one specific person than it is to anyone else. I hate clowns. <laughs> or I said it on record. I'm terrified of clowns. I have a clown phobia. It's not like a it's not like a joke, like, oh, I don't like clowns. No, I hate clowns. <laughs> I can't even pretend to put something on the end of my nose. No, we have a we have a clown nose that gave us at Walgreens and I won't let him put it on the kids or I won't want to put it on the baby. No, no, uh uh-uh. uh. Nope. I'm going to tell you, Melissa, uh, I came very close one time at buying a pop-up blow-up clown at a garage <laughs> sale that I was going to put in the back of your car. <laughs> I um, would have told you. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought better of it. Let's just say uh, I you, appreciate it was a good it. idea. <laughs> I'm yes. glad you thought At the time, better. you guys were letting me... You guys were uh, letting me live with you, and I figured if I wanted that to continue, I might as well uh, end in that idea. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure, like, if even if Dominic tried it, I'd throw his ass out. (laughs) And you see, I thought we were done with this 2016. Why are you bringing clowns back? As if 2017 doesn't have enough problems. Yeah, we have enough problems. Stay away. <laughs> yeah, come on. We, we have Nazis to deal with. <laughs> yeah, we don't have need to add clown clown Nazis. Oh, my God. It's even worse. Clown, clown Nazis. Nazis. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well, there's no easy way to segue into this episode. First and foremost, this is a fantastic episode. And I think we have a lot of comments as we go along in this episode. And then obviously a lot of closing thoughts about this episode. So let's just go over there and let's just dive right into it. All right. So like I mentioned, this is a really good episode. But I want to start with some background here before we get started. We know that the actor who plays Larry Zito, his name is John Deal. For Vice fans, you know that John Deal is a big fan of boxing that is a passion of his and so i think as we go through this episode we'll talk about that maybe at first glance this episode doesn't look like they're doing john deal justice but the more that you dig about him and you find out about about john deal it looks like this is a pretty good send-off episode for john deal on the show that yeah i think that it's fitting that they let they basically let him pick what he wanted the, the episode to be about and he is a boxer in real life so he's like a Tony Danza. Yeah, like he had boxing experience. And that comes through in the episode. You see him when he's sparring and when he's hitting the bags. And he and has stuff all the like knowledge that. and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. So I thought we- he looked pretty good when they were sparring. <laughs> so when we open, we're at a boxing match and Zito is bringing the duo, Tubbs and Crockett and Switek, to go watch a fight. They're not there to do any investigation. Zito is just bringing them there because he's really into boxing. He's excited to actually get them out and go take them to go see Why a boxing fight. He's excited about getting a hot dog. Yeah, he is about getting the food. He's like, when do I get the food? <laughs> we see some very nice dressed, nicely dressed mafia men ringside. They are deeply invest. Uh, they are deeply involved in the fight and watching it very closely. Some studies <laughs> deeply involved in those women. Just staring him down. <laughs> Sonny is all business. He as sur- soon as he sits down, he just scans the crowd like, "Who here have I had a run in with? <laughs> Who is a criminal?" And I know them. <laughs> and he locks on to someone named Oswaldo Guzman, and that happens to be our nicely dressed man that's in the crowd. And it's all 
Crockett's fault <laughs> right off the bat. If he could have just been normal and not been working at the boxing match, all this would be done. <laughs> <laughs> now, who's fighting is a young fighter named Sykes. And then his manager, who's his, his manager, Moon, is fantastic. <laughs> He's this big, giant guy with a big old cowboy hat. He's and you find out from what Zito was talking about when they're ringside and said he's not really much of a trainer. He is, but he's never trained anyone who's been this good. And Sykes is really good. Just mopping the floor with every person he gets into the ring with. And so Moon is actually played by Randall Tex Cobb, who was actually a boxer from nineteen seventy seven to ninety three. Wow. He had a record that's a long 40- career. <laughs> long career and he fought some pretty notable people but he ended up with a record of 43 7 and 1 and uh with 36 knockouts i mean pretty wow. good record you know 43 wins seven losses and what i mean by uh, some pretty notable bouts is those seven losses came from some pretty uh some former champs he lost to uh, ken norton in 81 lost to a young buster james buster douglas in 84 and Probably his most famous fight is he lost a 15-round decision to Larry Holmes in 82. And the fight is known for being so bloody that Howard Cosell actually said that he would never cover boxing again after that. And he didn't. That was just several weeks after Ray Mancini beat Dooku Kim, who died uh, several days after from head trauma. Immediately after that fight, this real bloody fight where Holmes basically just bloodied up Cobb. And Cosell was like, I'm done. This is too risky. Credit to Tex Cobb, like to actually get himself in line to get those kinds of fights. I know he may not have the best record against champs, but he was consistently there be challenging for an opportunity. Yeah, he beat some people on it in his own right. He defeated Leon Spinks, though, at the end of his career in 88. He defeated Ernie Shavers in 80. So, and believe it or not, before he got into boxing, he was 9-0 and with nine knockouts as a kickboxer. Uh, he wow. would end, end his kickboxing career at, at nine and two. That's a big That's man to pretty... be swinging around some legs. That's what I was going to say, man. He must have been like <laughs> a lot thinner. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. No. <laughs> I can't oh, picture that guy swinging his leg around. <laughs> by the way, his other acting credits, he was also in Grazing Arizona, Fletch Lives, Naked Gun, 33rd and a half, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective and Ernest Goes to Jail, as well as other movies similar to Ernest Goes to Jail. So <laughs> that's, that's where I know him from. <laughs> <laughs> well, ringside, Moon is he's just constantly yelling uppercut and then grabbing his cowboy hat. <laughs> I didn't understand that coaching, but okay. He's like, hit him. Hit him. <laughs> ringside, Oswaldo is very intrigued by Sykes, but we have this fast jump. We're just like, we're ringside, then all of a sudden we're at Guzman's house. And Oswaldo is paying his fighter, paying a fighter who had taken a dive in a fight. So he had told him at a certain round to take a dive. Actually, sorry, he lost in a decision. Like he took it all, all eight rounds. And so, but he shorted him. He's only paying him $150. And the fighter is really upset, getting very mouthy with the mob boss. <laughs> yeah, not a good idea. I don't know what he was doing there. And so they, obviously Guzman, doesn't take kindly to that. And they hold him down and then Oswaldo smashes his hand and we go to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct and Gina is going through all Guzman's history. Crockett obviously latched directly onto that and probably didn't pay any attention to the fight or anything else that was happening. He just stared at Guzman the entire time he was at the fight. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's got, but Guzman has no priors. He's got nothing on them for the last three years. He's been clean, so there's no reason to suspect him of anything. In fact, Guzman is so clean that he actually played a different character earlier in the series. <laughs> <laughs> played by Pepe. Huh? Zito says that. He's seen him around the fights because he goes and hangs out there a lot. And he throws a lot of money around, but he hasn't seen anything out of the ordinary. Like, it's it's not. He, you don't obviously see him doing crimes at the fights. And Sonny says that he's been trying to bring him down for years. And so they just run out. And they're going to go talk to someone. Him and Tubbs are going to go talk to someone named Mr. Cash. So, But one real fast scene before we get to Mr. Cash because he's fantastic. We have a quick driving scene where <laughs> Tubbs 
tells Crockett, quote, you blow in my ear, I'll follow you anywhere. But why are we, what are you so hot on this guy for, basically? And Sonny says that Guzman killed an informant he had up in Fort Lauderdale, and he impaled him on a metal spike, and so he's been basically wanting to get revenge ever since. Who knew he was so violent, though, that he could kill people if he didn't, he impaled them on spikes? <laughs> <laughs> there was some investigation. It obviously didn't go anywhere because they didn't arrest Guzman. But he's never forgotten about that 19-year-old informant that he got killed. Just, and all the yeah, other well, people that he's gotten killed. <laughs> but never mind. He, he, he's that. already forgot those people. <laughs> Like the 15 year old football player, and the they, of course, they didn't catch him because that actually requires police work. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the end of the driving scene, we pull up to Cash's house, and inside is a man, a crazy man. He's got wild hair, he's blabbering on about a bunch <laughs> of nonsense. Who knows what the hell he's talking about? He's just jibber jabbering on like crazy. And you know, it doesn't take much to recognize Don King. From Orbit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's an episode about boxing. And it's boxing in the 80s. And so that means Don King has yes. to make an appearance. Does that have to make sense? He has to make an appearance. <laughs> I don't think yes. that he was acting. I think that was just Actually, his personality. <laughs> it's just they didn't give him any lines. Believe it or not, then one other movie credit and an episode of Knight Rider. Don King really doesn't have much of an IMBD. Really? He's a behind-the-scenes type well, and unless he's in the middle of the stage talking. <laughs> um, so, but obviously manager, promoter, uh, and boxing promoter, and literally just worked with everybody. He promoted the rumble in the jungle between Ollie and Foreman. He promoted the thriller in Manila between Ollie and Frazier 3. He's worked with everyone. Ollie, Roberto Duran, who we met in prison here in Vice World, Julio Cesar Chavez, Mike Tyson, Holyfield, and pretty much everyone he's promoted has probably sued him at one point or or another. Yeah, he's not the um, most honest businessman. <laughs> I don't uh -huh. think. <laughs> which, which is what makes it ironic that the first thing he says in the show is, I think decent people would have nothing to do with that snake in the grass. And it's like, uh-huh. Yeah, Don. He also yeah. says what, some what other you... choice things like, he doesn't care about the fighters. He's cooking the books, winning lots of money, that he owns the entire Southeast. And then he also calls Guzman a, quote, coconut chili head <laughs> i don't know what that means i feel like that's racist i don't know <laughs> yeah uh, well you know i mean he, he he has killed two men so damn <laughs> yeah dude seriously in 57 he was charged with killing a guy that was trying to rob one of his gambling houses he shot him in the back in 67 don king was convicted of second degree murder because he stomped hit one of his employees sam garrett because he owed him six hundred dollars Oh, my God. He's connected, too, because in 83, he was pardoned by Ohio Governor Jim Rhodes. He got all kinds of people like Jesse Jackson and Loretta Scott King to write, like, letters to the to the governor, and they pardoned him. Damn. Damn. Don yeah. King does have some power. Yeah, I know. Maybe we shouldn't talk yeah. about him then. <laughs> <laughs> Only in America. <laughs> <laughs> so Sonny and Tubbs get the information that they want about that Guzman's still up to no good. He's just he's out there fixing fights. So then they're then they go to leave. What's great though in this scene is that clearly Tubbs and Crockett, not Tubbs and Crockett, sorry, that Don Johnson and Philip Michael Thomas love being there with Don King. They're all smiles and shaking his hand. I don't think that was acting. I think they were actually really excited to be hanging out with Don King. I think they they look like they were having fun. Like, yeah, <laughs> acting with them. Oh, dude, you know, you, you know, Don was like inviting them to the next fight. You know, oh, we're gonna sit you down right in front. <laughs> but the next big Don King promoted event was to go scan the crowd to see if you could find Don Johnson. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. <laughs> so now we head back to the precinct, and the full vice team is there. Ladies, B team, Castillo for a little bit. He kind of he's kind of in and out in this episode. Melissa's giving me the look like Castillo's going to be a problem in the future. I know he is. We'll get there, <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> and they're coming up with a plan because what Don, what Mr. Cash said <laughs> in the previous scene is that a way to get to Guzman is if you were to offer him like some TV deal, you can get on satellite. We'll broadcast your fights and we'll pay you to have your fights on TV. So that's what their plan is here. They're going to start something called the Sunbelt Sports Network. They're going to try and convince a young fighter, sorry, that they have a, that he can get a young fighter and Sykes 
because Zito knows Moon. Those two know each other. So he has an insight to the up and coming Sykes. And then also have Burnett and Cooper pitch that they're from the Sunbelt Sports Network. And then they'll use that to go talk to Guzman and set him up and try and get him on record for fixing fights and stuff like that. It's the dumbest plan that Vice has come up with. And they're also totally convincing Zito to go in on to convince Moon to train Sykes and to talk to Guzman, something he clearly does not want to do. No, he doesn't want to do it because Moon is his friend. And he's like, I don't want to bring him into this. And then they go, well, does Moon know that you're a cop? And he's like, yes, he does know. And they're like, well, just see, just talk to him. If we can't do it that way, we'll do it a different way. But he's like, I don't know. I don't, this doesn't feel right. This, and, you know, of course, no one listens to him, but. <laughs> <laughs> Their argument is, oh, we promise we won't get him killed. You know, not like before. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they, they're like, oh, no, he has nothing. To, don't worry. He has nothing to worry. You have nothing to worry about. You're, the, he'll be, they're not going to touch the golden gonna, goose. Yeah, exactly. He's safe. And Zito yeah, ends it. They don't have a problem turning someone in the bait when they're actually involved in criminal en- enterprises. We're talking about taking two civilians and using them as bait. A two kid. Unsuspecting, like, yeah, uh, a kid. A kid. He's like 19. Yep. And they don't care. nothing to do with any of the criminal activities going on. Other than he's just a good fighter. Like he's caught Guzman's attention because he's good. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. But it's okay, though. It's all right. They assure him it'll be okay. Zito mm-hmm. does say it before we leave the precinct. He says, I really hope Guzman is worth all this. And, of course, Crockett's like, oh, of course he is, because Crockett came up with this ridiculous plan. (laughs) Uh, He has the best judgment. I mean, you know, he just got a killer off of death row in the last episode. (laughs) Yeah, why are they even listening to him? We head out to Guzman, and this is where the duo are doing their best Don King impersonation? I don't know what they're doing in this. (laughs) He may have crossed the line with... He's telling Guzman, we want a guy... That's like Cassius King, not Ali, but like Ca- Ca- uh, Cassius Clay. Sorry. Guzman says, well, what about Hidalgo? And Burnett or Crockett says, no, we don't, that's old news. We don't want old people. We want this up and coming kid in Sykes to be the one that we're going to premiere. You, we can get you on the network. We can pay you $50,000 per event. So if you can get yourself an up and coming fighter like Sykes, we're in business. Problem one. <laughs> Problem one is Sykes don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so then we head over to the gym and the B team show up, or Zito's going to talk to Moon and talk to him about what the plan is. So I text getting a job at the gym. Because he's like, what am I supposed to do when they talk about it? He goes, what am I supposed to do? Like, well, you can get a job as like sweeping up or something. <laughs> and he's like, okay. Uh, I, I love it too, because he's getting, you come in and uh, he's getting instructions on how to mop the floor. Uh, like, like, yeah. he, he is not even trusted with a mop. <laughs> <laughs> Zito goes to talk to Moon and really quick in the conversation Moon sees right through Zito and what he's trying to do. He's asking him straight up like why are you here? Why are you talking to me? You're not here to talk to me about training Sykes or something else that's going on here. He also gives us a little information about Sykes that Sykes isn't very... He doesn't like cops very much because one killed his brother and I think this episode's just gonna make that dislike of cops worse. <laughs> that comes back up in the second episode. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Zeno kind of approaches what the deal is that they on, on what they want to do and Moon... Just comes straight out and says he's concerned about Sykes getting hurt. He doesn't want to put his fighter in a position where he's going to get hurt. And that if he gets hurt, he, Moon is going to hurt Zito. It's pretty clear. He doesn't want to do it. Then Moon turns to Sykes and says, hey, Zito wants to fight you now. <laughs> yeah, he wants to box you. Uh-huh. <laughs> he like just jumps to then Zito's in headgear and he's got his gloves on. And we get a pretty good sparring match with Zito. Like... He, he clearly knows yeah, how to I, box. In all serious, the scene at the very open in the boxing, you could see it was clearly like Rocky f- fake boxing, you know, with the, the over-the-top sound effects and the clear whips. And then you get this one. Mind you, Stakes is played by Mark Breland, who's also a retired boxer who was 35 wins, 3 losses, 1 draw with 25 KOs as a professional. And as an amateur, he won 5 New York Golden Gloves 
gloves and a gold medal in the 1984 Olympics. He went 110-1 as an amateur. He wow, held the so he's WA, legit. Yeah, he held the WBA welterweight twice in 87 and 89. Actually, has some. he, he has a couple acting credits. Uh, he was in Heat Game and Summer of Sam. But yeah, I mean, he's a legit boxer. And when you see him and Zito in the sparring match, they're legitimately sparring there. Like, almost like they just kind of let him go with it for a few minutes. Then when you come out of it and you, Zito wakes up on the floor because he gets knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you got to bob and weave, man. You can't go straight in. You, you, you got to come at angles, you know. Punch with bad intentions. <laughs> My favorite part is when he gets knocked out and then when he comes to is how concerned Switek is for him. He's like, is he okay? And they're like, yeah, he's fine. He's got his <laughs> bell rung. He'll be okay. But he's like just all like hovering around him. Like, what? are you okay? Are you all right? <laughs> so Switek also doesn't like when they're at the precinct and they're, put it, they're pressuring Zito. Switek doesn't like that either. No. He is not for this at all. No, because because zito doesn't want to do it so he's like okay i don't you know he doesn't like it while they're helping zito up a man in a suit comes in and moon grabs him starts nick starts manhandling him and the man in the suit is very scared because he's little (laughs) (laughs) such a tiny little man (laughs) but he does give moon an envelope saying that from guzman that he'll buy sykes's contract or buy Sykes on a contract for $50,000. Of course, Moon wants nothing to do with it and just runs him out of the gym. Not before he, he sticks the check in the guy's mouth and tells him <laughs> to tell Guzman to eat yeah. it. <laughs> so then we head over to Moon's trailer, and it's later that evening. Moon and Zito are talking, and this is when Moon finally agrees with this plan, that he will step aside, let Zito train Sykes to set up this thing. And personally, I think it's because he saw... Guzman's men for the first time. The first time he's had to deal with Guzman. He knew that he was a thing, that he was bad for the boxing in, in the area, but he never had to personally deal with him. And now that he had to deal with him, he's had a change of heart. He will step back, allow the vice team to do their investigation and bring down Guzman because that's what's best for boxing. Yes. And well, Zito not exactly saying, step back. <laughs> and Zito <laughs> is saying, like, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe this is a bad idea after he saw how moon handle that guy i think he saw the writing on the wall and it was like no 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 no. this isn't the, maybe this isn't a good idea maybe this could go bad i don't think yeah. we should do this and then he's like no you you train him and i think this goes back to moon having the change of heart and actually having to deal with guzman so he doesn't just necessarily step back obviously moon he seems like more of a hands-on guy <laughs> very next scene he goes all walker texas ranger on one of the bodyguards at guzman's house <laughs> at the pool hog he ties him. him yeah you hog ties him well can we talk about why that guy was gonna sunbathe <laughs> with his like dress pants on i mean the that's boss kinda weird. is gone like, <laughs> yeah he's probably like thank god the boss is gone i can finally use the pool <laughs> the boat's not even pulled away from the harbor or whatever from the, like their little uh dock there and he's like taking his shirt off and laying on the <laughs> chair yeah i bet you if moon hadn't hogtied him in about 15 minutes he was going to be drinking the boss's beer <laughs> <laughs> and then moon goes inside and proceeds to trash the place not like secretly trying to find because he's what he's looking for is his ga- is Guzman's gambling book. But he doesn't try and hide that he's trying to find it. He goes in there and just rips the place apart until he finds it. Also, he doesn't sneak around. Like he could have just snuck around and done that, right? Couldn't he have just knocked that guy out from behind and he would have never seen it was Moon? But instead, no, he goes like crazy hog ties him, tells him like it's me, punches him. <laughs> I'm Moon, punches him, then goes in the house and destroys it. Who is basically the size of the big show. I don't think he can sneak anywhere. <laughs> and of course, when Guzman comes pulling back up, he sees that his man's tied up. They untie him. He says it was Moon. Or sorry, he says it was that crazy man. It was that crazy cowboy or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And they go inside and they see that the place has been trashed. So of course they're gonna go find Moon. They they know what he he was there. You know, everyone knows what trailer he lives in. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> I do want to take one step back before we go over to Moon's. There's a brief scene at the gym before we come out to Guzman's, and he gets on the yacht and goes out, and all this stuff happens. Where Zito is talking to Sykes, and they're talking about their families. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and Sykes talks about that he's got a dead brother. One of them's in prison. 
Zito says he's got four sisters, but one brother who OD'd. Where was this character development for Zito before this? Because we basically yeah, lost Zito like halfway through season two. And in his final episode, we finally get some character development on him. We really only had one opportunity to build character with him. And that was in Made for Each Other, which is like which is like in the first half of season one. Which is why why he left, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole point. <laughs> So yeah, there's that. <laughs> yeah, that and that that was gonna be in. I mean, I want to talk about it more in the wrap yeah. up of the show. That's but, that's what I was um, thinking too. But yeah, obviously, it is very bittersweet that his final episode is our first real chance to get to know Zito in a Zito specific episode. Yeah, exactly. That's what I said. Like this is the most he's talked. The the, the most lines they've given him in anything. Like this is the most, uh, like over the whole entire all the seasons. And with that character development, mm. this is so we'll go over to Moon's trailer. Moon is sleeping. He gets woken up by Guzman. And I have a question. First of all, does Moon ever take off his cowboy getup? Because he sleeps in it, too. It's the same one. <laughs> Not a different shirt unless he's got 40 million blue shirts or something. I think they filmed Tex Cobb's scenes in all in one day. Yeah, no, for sure. Also, he didn't look like he had a washer and dryer in that trailer. So I'm just saying. <laughs> Moon, after he gets woken up, he sits up and says to Guzman that he should have remembered the hot sauce because Pepper Belly's like Guzman, like hot sauce. Whatever yeah, he's full of uh, the <laughs> semi-racist innuendo, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Guzman is obviously very upset. But Moon, he's an idiot. What what did he think was going to happen? And he tries to say, like, well, you got nothing on me. You can't hurt me or anything. I got your gambling book, which I guess is what he thought he was going to help the police. I, I think that's what it was. I think he was going to, like, help the investigation. But only Guzman says, like, my name's not in there. So I don't really care. <laughs> and it's in code. Yeah, yeah, it's well, whatever. I'm sure his code is <laughs> pretty easy to crack. He's not the brightest. <laughs> and so then Guzman and a few of his men leave and one man stays behind, shoots and kills Moon. And so when we come back, we fade to black and we come back and we're at the crime scene. The duo over there was Zito. And Zito is obviously very upset. It's his friend. It's a close friend of his. And he feels specifically responsible for Moon's death. Because he said because he didn't want to get him involved. And he says that I didn't want to get him involved. I told you guys I didn't want to do this. And look what happened. Yeah, exactly what he thought was going to happen. They got him killed. Really am irritated with this scene because I feel like Tubbs is like, oh, man, come on, just calm down. It's like, OK, yeah, maybe you kill people every day. <laughs> maybe you kill your witnesses every day. But I like to keep mine alive. OK, Tubbs, Tubbs gets more upset over dead hookers than he does. About yeah, not even dead hookers. Friend and co-worker. Yeah, he got more upset over murdering hookers than he did about <laughs> someone. Oh, sorry. I mean, I hate to bring it up, but he got more upset about murdering hookers than he did his own kid. So... <laughs> 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 and Crockett's like, this is our job. This is what we do. We murder people that are yeah. our friends for our, our job to bring yeah. the case. Crockett just totally discounts it. Like, like, oh, you know, he, he was expendable. This is what we do. We put civilians in danger <laughs> to help day. us break cases. <laughs> of course Zito runs out and he goes and grabs Sykes. Now Sykes, he's had a rough go. He's got a dead brother, one that's in prison. He's got essentially no family. Moon was like his only family, and now he's been killed. And so Zito goes with Sykes, and they go on a walk. Sykes is saying that he's scared. He's upset, but he's also scared, and he feels alone. Zito says he's not alone. Sykes then says, well, then fine. You train me then. You're the, only, you're the last person that, that I have in this world now. <laughs> Oh, God, stop saying that stuff. <laughs> it's too much. I can't handle it. And, of course, Zito agrees. And he's <laughs> yeah. not doing it because he's a cop. He's not doing it because of the case. He just agrees to train Sykes because Moon was his friend. And Sykes feels like he's got no one left. So then we go, we stay in the gym. And there's now Zito's full in training with Sykes. And a man, a different man in a suit shows up from Guzman. And he wants to manage Sykes. He's willing to pay Sykes $1,500 a month plus a car. Plus an apartment. The man tries to say he's not affiliated with Guzman, but Zito obviously sees right through it and tells him to get lost. Which I still think this isn't Zito the cop helping to set up the case. This is Zito now Sykes' trainer. Yeah, I think that was, he just didn't want him next mm -hmm. to him. Like, I don't know. It's just bad news, basically. After the yeah, uh, yeah, like he's trying to protect Sykes. After the pseudo man leaves, the duo shows up and Switek hits Sonny with the mop. <laughs> you think that was acting? You no, think no, no, that was like, uh... 
<laughs> I don't really like you. <laughs> What's funny in this is that the duo continue to, they have to act like they're the characters from Sunbelt. They have to act like Burnett and Cooper, who are these extreme sales guys, because Sykes needs to believe that he, there's a chance he'll get on TV. He can't know that any of them are mm-hmm. cops. And so they really lay it on thick. And when Zito says, like, oh, we got an offer for 1500 a month, and Tubbs says, of course, Tubbs says, oh, that's chump change. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the streak alive, Tubbs. Keep the streak alive. <laughs> Why are you jumping us, Zito? <laughs> <laughs> and then they work out a deal, and Sykes really thinks he's getting a contract. What they talk about is on the way there to the gym where where the duo talk about how they feel bad that they have to lie to him. Oh, Carkin says, I, I feel bad having to lie to this kid. He He doesn't deserve it. And it's funny because it's like now he feels bad, but no, you feel bad now that you have to lie to the kid. Oh, and what's going to happen next is going to make it much worse. So yep. now it's fight night. There's a long boxing montage here where Guzman and the duo are rings up. They're not together, but they're both watching. And Sykes, and it's this isn't one night. This is like a series of nights of boxing where Sykes is just knocking out opponent after opponent after he is dominating. And you can see like that Guzman's getting more intrigued with Sykes. He really wants to make this deal happen. Sykes is a fantastic boxer. And I'm thinking, based on how many different fights he has, how long are they stringing this kid along? Weeks. It's got to be weeks that they're stringing him along and he thinks he's going to get these big fights and he's going to end up on TV. But they don't care because it's going to make a case. So <laughs> At the end of the montage, Sonny goes behind the scenes into the locker room and he goes and talks to Guzman. And this is this is where if you, got to, if you, you can try and defend Sonny, I think this is the time where you can't defend their plan is at this very moment. Sonny tells Sykes that Sykes got a contract, which Guzman didn't know about. He's shocked when he hears that Sykes has gotten a contract. And Sonny says, yeah, his trainer Zito got him a contract. And he's going to sign with Zito, basically. Yeah, he's going to sign. Mm -hmm. And Guzman then says, well, what, what about my TV deal? If I can't get Sykes, what about anyone else? And Burnett says, if you can't get Sykes, the deal's off. So now Guzman is desperate to make a deal or make it so that Hidalgo will so that Sykes loses. Hidalgo wins, and then he feels like he has a shot at this TV contract. But now he's backing a animal into a corner. Yeah. Well, I mean, how is he gonna respond? Mm-hmm. I don't understand why that was the tactic. Why couldn't they just let him like, okay, so yeah, you can't get Sykes, but maybe you can get somebody else. He still would have come up with something and they still would have done the same thing. They didn't even have to do that. But no, they backed him into a corner and he came out. (laughs) Way to throw Zito out there in in harm's way. Because, I mean, obviously, if he can't get Sykes to change his mind, the only other way is to eliminate the guy who's managing him. And then he'll have no choice Um, but to sign. If he wants to do if he wants to be a boxer, that's what they you know, he'd have to sign with anybody. Because he'd have yeah. nobody. Obviously, I mean, we run, the show continues to run through. We're getting toward the end of the show. But they ne- there's no follow-up scene where he's telling Zito, Hey, watch your back, man. We just poked the bear a bit. <laughs> All there is is one brief scene where they're reviewing the case of Zito and that he just has to wear a wire to get Guzman on record for saying that he wants to buy Sykes's contract. And then any other information that, that he can get out of him. But this is the setup of the conversation between Guzman and Zito. That's the only way they feel like that they can that this whole plan will work. Zito is obviously really nervous, and he doesn't like that they're playing with Sykes' career. He clearly still doesn't want to do this. He's more nervous because of Sykes, because he doesn't want to ruin his career. And they're, they're wasting his time, does, basically, spinning his wheels, and he's never going to get anything out of them. Does it, did it bother any of you guys that they're trying to coach him on how to be a cop? Yeah, like, I know. And they're telling sure him, like, bring what up he needs the gambling to do. And, yeah, I know. That, yeah, that's it's, it's like, the well, duo, right? Like, because they're the top cops, right? Like, we're the ones in charge. We make these. But apparently, they forget that Switek and Zito were cops before they were ever around. And they know actually had to do their jobs. And they do stuff all the time without them. But, you know, hey. <laughs> coaching them like he was some kind of fitness or something it's very similar to when like, trudy shot that person in that episode where they're like oh this is like okay but isn't she been a cop this whole entire show so why are you acting like she's never shot somebody well, i've seen her shoot people mm-hmm. <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> i've seen her shoot people <laughs> all right so we're into the second to the last 
scene of this episode. We stop off in the locker room. Sykes has got a big fight that night. Zito's getting him ready. The same suited man that Zito had talked to in the gym comes and says that Guzman will buy Sykes' contract for $200,000. But Zito says make it $250,000 and a piece of Guzman's gambling because he has to do this because he needs to talk to Guzman. He can't talk to one of his uh, his thugs. He has to talk to Guzman. The suit leaves, basically saying, you don't know who you're messing with. And right then, right behind him, the duo show up and review the setup again. Make sure you get to him to talk. Zito says, I got a meeting with him at 10 a.m. tomorrow. It's going to happen at the gym. That's when we're going to get him. And so then we go on to the fight. Now, this is this is Guzman's last chance now. Cash, or Don King, is in the middle of the ring. They're introducing the fighters. It's Sykes versus Hidalgo, Guzman's top dog in this fight. If he can beat Sykes, maybe he'll have a chance of still getting that TV contract. To his credit, Hidalgo comes out fighting hard. And he's he has some cheap shots in there, but I do want to point I'm not gonna go through the whole fight here, but I do want to point out a couple of things. One, Hidalgo's fighting dirty, which means that Guzman is basically has a gun to his head. Like you have to make this happen because that's definitely what it feels like when he's fighting. Two, in round one and in round six, sorry, in round eight, th- when they're getting ready to go fight in the filming, they do such a fantastic job in filming this fight scene because it's, it, they do a good job. But in the sound, there's a church dong that yeah, like plays in the background, right? Yeah, in key moments during this fight, signaling to you, the viewer, something serious, real serious is going to happen. You're, what you are watching is something that's going to lead to something very serious. It happens twice. Yeah, I thought it was amazing. Yeah. That they worked that in there. Mm-hmm. The fight scene, I mean, an extended scene. They they cover, like, the majority of the fight. You see a little bit of each round throughout the fight. Fantastic. You know, you feel like you're watching a boxing movie during the, that scene because they didn't just rush through it. But they took their time. You saw it, like I said, you could pick up on those other elements and it's filmed. To Sykes' credit, Hidalgo is fighting dirty. He's headbutting. It's a, it's a hard fight. And Sykes comes through in the end in the final round and knocks out Hidalgo. So now let's go back in time. Let's go back to when Sonny said that there's no deal unless you have Sykes. Guzman is back doing a corner Hidalgo thing. If he doesn't, if Zito doesn't take the bye, then Hidalgo has to win. Hidalgo gets knocked out. What is Guzman's only response here then? If he can't convince Zito and he can't get his best fighter to win, the thing that has to happen here is to eliminate the competition. That's stopping him from getting this contract. And and that's a hell of a lot cheaper than $250,000 and a percentage of his his income. Absolutely. So at the end of the fight, there's a big celebration. Obviously, Zito is very ecstatic because he's a trainer in this. He's not just a cop. He trained Sykes to win this big fight. And it's his friend, too. As a friend, not, not just a trainer. Switek comes up and grabs him and tells Zito, like, we're going out after the after. And so Zito just has to make one quick stop and he heads out to the gym. So here we are at the final scene of this episode. He walks in. He's alone. The gym is empty. The music's playing in the background. It's kind of smoky outside. So they do a good job of building up this scene. You see as Zito is in there, a car comes pulling up and three of Guzman's men come walking in. Zito is totally alone. No vice team, no backup, nothing. He doesn't have anything. He is there alone. We jump outside and we see Zwitek's car come pulling up in front of the gym. Zwitek gets out. He's got some food with he's got him. got him food to celebrate, yeah. And he comes in. He starts calling for Larry. No answer. So Zwitek starts to get nervous. He pulls his gun out and he starts running around the building because he knows something is wrong. His friend wouldn't mm-hmm. do that. He wouldn't He wouldn't be doing something shady if he wasn't there. There's something wrong. He comes through the building. He gets to the back of the gym where the shower, the showers are running. He turns the corner. You have the camera from behind Zwitek. He turns the corner and he sees Zito. He's sitting on a chair propped up in the corner in the shower. He's got a needle sticking out of his arm and he's clearly died. And Zwitek, Zwitek Tech doesn't he doesn't run to his friend he doesn't scream out you just see this look of despair come across Switek's face as he sees his dead best friend who just had one of the biggest nights of his life dead sitting in the shower he walks over to him he kneels beside him he doesn't try and shake him or check for a pulse he just reaches out to his friend and embraces him in the final moments of the scene in one of the most memorable moments in all of TV, that he's there with his best friend who has died, and he feels like he's failed him. Mm-hmm. And he caresses him and holds mm-hmm. him 
and we get to be continued at the end of the episode. And yeah. I cry. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like you're saying, there wasn't that opt-in sync. He hesitates to touch him or he immediately calls someone. Now, it's almost like this last goodbye. It still hasn't settled it into him yet. And he goes over and he just embraces them and it, it's just it's between friends at that point there's no he's not a cop he's not thinking about anything else not thinking about the case it, it's it's like you said just this despair this is probably the most powerful we've ever seen miami vice 2 they've tackled some serious topics here but this is one of their own this is someone that has worked on virtually every case with them that they're now losing one of their own and we'll see in the next episode but there's got to be a lot of soul searching on that team because we've talked about through this episode that they have failed zito through this setup they left him out to dry on this i'm not gonna say anything and, and, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> <quite>. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and the worst part of them hanging them out to dry is that guzman killed moon like the writing should have been on the wall that this guy he's that type of guy He's rather going to kill the competition than deal with them. Yeah, like, I don't it understand have been... what they expected. That's the whole reason why they started the case, right? Because Crockett said he was so evil and he had done so many bad things and that they knew that he had killed his informant and he had impaled him. He's really bad. That's what we're why we need to get him. But we don't need to protect anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we have lots more closing thoughts on that, so I'm sure we could go on for a long time. Yes. <laughs> Let's go talk about the music, and then we'll sum up our final thoughts on this episode. Because like I said, I don't think any of us are going to be in disagreement that this being a good episode. And I think that the writing and the directing and the acting point are all making us think this on purpose. So let's go talk. Let's talk about that in our final thoughts, though. Let's go talk about the music in this episode. All right, John, a little bit lighter on the music this week than normal, but I'm excited to see a hairband show up in the music. What do you got for us this week? All right. So I'm going to get this one out of the way first. We have There's a River by Steve Winwood. Steve Winwood was also in the music for Trust Fund Pirates. So he's a repeat offender. Uh, you <laughs> might remember he was, he, he's been in bands such as the, the Spencer Davis group. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with the band Traffic. He was inducted in 04. He was in the band Blind Faith with Eric Clapton and in the band Go. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on it because, so not only has he already been in an episode, he's going to be in two more episodes not just two more episodes, but this exact song is going to be in another episode. <laughs> That's what's crazy is that this exact song will make a comeback. Yes. So we'll talk about this exact song in the episode A Bullet for Crockett. Now, I think that there's going to be some high-end or semblance between the two. That's what I was just thinking. But, Based on Hackman last week and the Peter Gabriel song, well, I will come back in season four. I have a feeling that this song coming back might have something to do with this storyline coming back somehow. Yes, we are starting to get a theme where uh, apparently Vice is trying to get cute with the music and tie it in the storylines. <laughs> Not cool, guys. I got to talk about this every week. <laughs> They didn't even think about me at all. <laughs> Our other song is Dance by Rat, an L.A. hair metal band. And if you grew up in the 80s, you probably know who Rat is. Little background, all the way back as far as 1973, the band. It started with Stephen Percy in Hollywood with a band called Fire Dome. Fire Dome became Crystal Pistol, which is still, uh, which is actually my favorite of all the different band names. <laughs> uh, they would then become Buster Cherry and then eventually Mickey Rat. Throughout all of those changes, the lineup of who played guitar, or this or that, it kept changing. The only thing that was consistent was Percy. About 1981, they shortened Mickey Rat to Rat, and the lineup kind of finally started to settle out a little bit. Between 80, 82 and 83 is when they finally got their their core group of members. Even then, they had changes in lineup over the time. Primary members of Rat being Percy, Robin Crosby, Chris Barato, 
Warren DeMartin, and Bobby Blotzer. And dude, they actually kicked butt when they first rolled out. You know, in 83, they got a record deal with Time Coast and released a seven-track EP. That propelled them in 84 to get a record deal from Atlantic Records. And their first album from there, Out of the Cellar, would right out of the gates. It would be multi-platinum. And would feature one of their most notable songs, Round and Round, which would hit uh, number 12 on the Billboard Top 40. Their success would continue. 86 is Dancing Undercover, even though the critics declared it a relative disappointment, still went platinum. And their song Body Talk was featured in the Eddie Murphy film The Golden Child. Interesting, because at this time uh, for This Week in Vice, The Golden Child is the number one movie in the box office, too. So that's kind of interesting it, timing that they're in this episode of Miami Vice, and their song is also in the number one movie. Dancing on the cover is where this song Dance comes from. So it was a new hot song, and Rat was an MTV band. MTV was still kind of a fledgling network at the time, and Rat was all about the music videos and concert footage and all of that stuff. They were all over MTV during this time. But the 80s were fun. Here come the 90s, and in 90, between 90 and 91, guitarist Rob, Robin Crosby would start to have issues with substance abuse, and it would reach the point where it would start affecting his stage presence. So after a brief stint in rehab during the Japanese leg of one of their tours, they'd actually start taking away solos from him because he just couldn't, he wasn't sober enough to perform them. Ouch. And they would start, yeah, they would literally started moving around songs on how they would perform them so that he wouldn't be the lead guitarist, Ouch. basically. Eventually, that would lead to them firing him, and he really wouldn't ever record with them again. He would be replaced by Michael Schenker of the Scorpions, and actually, he was the one who immediately replaced them, but that role would change a few more times throughout the rest of the band. Back to the 90s, it was short-lived for him because uh, in 91, they were featured on the first season of MTV Unplugged, and they would release their final single, Nobody Rides for Free, which would also be featured on the Point Break soundtrack. And then they would really <laughs> go on hiatus until about the 2000s when the reunion started, but they wouldn't actually record anything new until, God, I think 2015. Really? Mm hmm. So Piercy would leave and form a band called Arcade. Robin Crosby and Chris Barato would form a band called Secret Service. This was just immediately after in 91 when they split. Warren DeMarco would do solo work and would also join briefly the band Whitesnake. Um, Interesting. Bobby Blotzer would actually take five years off of the music business and open a carpet cleaning business. <laughs> So for five years, and then eventually he get he, he's gonna come back with a vengeance later. But for right now, he's cleaning carpets. <laughs> <laughs> so then, at, at the time, they had the other band members who had joined at the time, Juan Krupker. I am not pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> Crucier. He would produce a bunch of underground bands. Semi local legend as far as LA producers would go, and then. They, there was even a member at one point during the reunion period whose name was Jizzy Pearl. Mm. J-I-Z-Z-Y Pearl. <laughs> I'm just bringing that up because his name was Jizzy Pearl. I just so, want to say that. <laughs> yes. The, in the 2000s, after the their reunion tour in the late 90s, this is where it starts to get a little complicated. Piercy would, uh, would leave to go on tour with his band Nitronic. And then Nitronic would become Rat, featuring Stephen Piercy. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, he left Rat to start Rat featuring Stephen Piercy. <laughs> A legal battle would ensue, and actually, De Martin and Bloodier, the carpet cleaner, would win the rights to Tours Rat. Okay. So for a little while there, there were two versions of Rat touring at the same time. <laughs> Bloodier and De Martin would, would tour basically as Rat, and there would be a few more different type of uh, attempts at reunions, but it was always a mixed bag of which band members would show up or participate. Until 2015, once again, there were two versions of Rat 
And once again, there was a legal battle. As <laughs> Bobby Blotzer had rat experience, one of the other band members would be touring with Rat's Deep Cuts. So a legal battle would ensue again, and uh, Blotzer, thinking that he still had the legal right because he won the case the first time, had the right to do it. I think it's still all kind of mixed up. When I got to the end of the article, I really didn't see it say who actually has the rights to Tor's Rat. Now, I would, I would say so, just wait for both versions of Rat to come to your county fair. <laughs> they yes. are definitely making the rounds. <laughs> Speaking of that, what's kind of funny about that is in 2008, they did a Caribbean cruise with Motley Crue. And then in 2009, they did a cruise called Ship Rocked with a couple of other of, uh, well, let's just say it, washed up metal bands, hair metal bands. So they're already working the cruise liners. <laughs> it reminds me of the time we saw Casey and the Sunshine Band at the Merced County Fair. <laughs> what up, Merced? <laughs> Shout what out up, Merced. To Merced. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just it's got to be so disheartening that like you you can tell there was a point in the '90s in which just rat to stop being the powerhouse hair metal band that they were, but they just couldn't give it up, and no matter what other band. They tried to start because they kept going. They, Piercy would leave for his band, blah, blah, blah. You know, DeMartin would go play with this band over here or play with him or do solo work or this or that. But no matter what band they tried to form after the fact, they always had to come back to Rat to try mm -hmm. and get, basically to try and make a paycheck to the point where they're, they're, they're going on, they're performing on cruise liners, you know, like you said, coming to a state fair near you so <laughs> yeah <laughs> there you go there's your music <laughs> i when i when i saw rat on here i was excited like these suckers got got, got something good <laughs> <laughs> I know we got a lot of final thoughts on this episode, so let's go break down and give our final thoughts on this one. Okay, I'm going to kick off because uh, I'm going to kind of get out of the way here. <laughs> <laughs> this was a really good episode, and I actually think it was a good way to send off Zito or John Deal, who had said he wanted off the show. He's going to fo focus more on theater. Obviously, he was feeling slighted a little bit based on how much time he was getting on screen in Miami Vice. I think that they they came through with a really good episode for a send off. And, and the moment, the last moment in the episode was Switek is so fantastic TV. Like they just hit it out of the park with this episode. There's obviously some finger pointing that you can do at the rest of the Vice team, but I think we're going to get some more answers to that in the second half of this story. We're going to find out some more, and I know that this storyline doesn't disappear. We don't end down for the count, and Zito never comes back up, that his death will become something of a plot point going into, especially in the final season. So I'm sad. I'm really sad to see Zito go. I'm really sad to see the B team get broken up and that for Switek to be alone here, but I think they did it right. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, I am in complete agreement. This was a fantastic episode from all points. I mean, from the way, from the flow of it, from from everything. It's a fantastic episode. It is an incredibly sad episode, and it is it, honestly a little disappointing that it took to the third season to them killing off. He's a mainstay character, you know, even if he doesn't have the most lines, even if he's not Crocodile Tubbs been here with us the whole time. It took him all the way till they killed him off for us to finally get episode that was just solely for him. Even in the episode made for each other, it's actually more of a Switek story than it is a Zito story. It really is. Gina has her episodes. Trudy has her episodes, even though they're they're a little fewer than than the others. Crockett get, gets his episodes. Everybody's gotten. They're individual episodes. The one episode we had that that was a Zito heavy episode was a Zito and Zwitek heavy episode. It wasn't just Zito. 
We didn't learn anything about his past. We didn't meet his former partner. It was like a B-team episode, basically. It's a little disappointing that we didn't get to meet this fantastic character, like really get to meet him until they killed him off. You watch it, you see how he is, uh, how he's passionate about boxing. He talked a little bit about his family. I want to learn more about Zito, but I can't because he dies at the end of the episode. Like I said, it's a little bittersweet because he... It's a fantastic episode, and like you said, it's a it's a fan it's a great way for them to send him off. I just wish we had gotten more of this earlier in the in the series. So yeah, you know, and I, I think the only other thing about this episode that that's uh, disappointing is that it seems like his death is directly related to the rest of the Vice Squad not giving enough of a of a crap basically you know <laughs> they put all of the pressure on zito to do this plan to sacrifice you know put his friend and uh, his both of his friends as bait and uh, essentially put himself out there as bait they pressure him in the in the doing all of this and they he they don't support him at all they don't protect him at all so in the end when he dies you can't help but just blame the rest of the vice squad because it's like had they taken, I, I don't know, had they taken it more seriously at any point, he might not be dead. Something that I didn't mention in my final thoughts, and I and I know that's obvious to all of us, is that needle in the arm in the end. And we know Zito, and I know that this is going to come up in the second half of this of this story, but we know Zito. That's not him. So there's still a really big plot point that they need to tackle here. That he is not a junkie. That, that and that's a very interesting move by the writers and directors of Miami Vice. That that's how they had him. They didn't have him be shot. They like, staged like an overdose, which is something that's really interesting. And I'm really intrigued to see how that ha how that plays out in the second half. Yeah. So I mean, I, I guess my final final thought on all of this is I'm gonna miss you, Zito. Wish we got to know each other better. <laughs> Absolutely. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I know you've been holding these thoughts for years. <laughs> you have your moment to talk My about moment. Zito's Finally. final episode in Miami Vice. Well, I mean, obviously, it's a great episode, even if it crushes me and tears me up inside. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an exaggeration. I cried a lot. No. <laughs> Many times. No. Um, no, I mean, I love the episode. It's a wonderful episode. It's I think it's a great tribute to Zito that they took something that John Deal likes to do in real life and they made it really uh, in, in like intricate and you can tell there's passion to it and that they actually were trying to give him a good send off. But I mean, for me, it really when the af after the episode is over, it really ruins the show for me. Not ruins. I shouldn't say ruins it. It's just I will. N I never felt the same after he was gone. It just was never the same. And especially, and I mean, I know you guys are going to watch it and you're going to see for yourself, but it especially makes Zwitek a different person. And in a, in a way, it's a good thing because he's way more involved in the the future episodes, and there's more storylines for him. But he really goes down a dark path, and it's like you feel and you feel sorry for him. Also, um, you guys are talking about the Odin. I will say an important thing that they talked about is that his brother OD'd, and that's going to come back up in the second episode that, that have killing him off when he would potentially OD'd when he was really whatever murdered, but that his brother OD'd that's going to be used against him. Mm, interesting thrown against him. And, mm. and you're going to, and, and you're going to continue for the next, the, sec the next episode, you're going to continue to learn things about Zeta that you didn't know. And that it's going to be said in the show like they didn't know these things about, except mm. for Switek, of course. But and Tubbs and Crockett will be like, well, we didn't even know that about him. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, I was frustrated with the way that I feel like the way that nobody did their job. And I wish I could say that this is going to change the carelessness that sometimes Crockett, he's got a big ego and he feels like he can do anything and everything will turn out all right. And it's all for the right reasons. And. He's always on this like superiority, like power trip. Well, I mean, I wish it would like say later on down the line, he'd be like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And I've changed the way I do things, but it doesn't. <laughs> so. Well, Melissa, I know that every time you go down this path and you get to this episode, this is a heart wrencher. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie and say that, you know, it's like, oh, it wasn't for me. Either. I think we all have been really attached to Zito. And it's, it is. It's going to be a different show. Now, it's going to be a little bit easier to handle because they kind of made him disappear up yeah, until like, this episode. Yeah. 
but That's man, true. what is what a feeling it is to then get them back bigger and better than ever, and, and then, then have it be taken away. Just dash him, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be the same Miami Vice without. Larry Zito. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear your feedback. What are your thoughts on Zito's final episode? And what are some of your favorite Zito moments? I have to say, every time I saw Zito in the bug van, you can point to that's one of my favorite moments just in the show (laughs) in general. (laughs) Especially him working on the bug van, making it like make spring noises and stuff like that when they honk the horn. We would love to hear from you and what your favorite Zito moments are and what you think of, the sh- of this episode and what happens to the show after Zito's gone. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com or you can tweet at us at go with the heat. We would love to hear from you. Make sure to go check out the website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find all of our show notes. You can find all the ways to contact us and all the ways to subscribe to the show. Also, we would really appreciate it if you went to your podcast platform of choice and left us a review. It really helps people find the show, and it really helps us out a lot. So we we would really like your help in that. Help people find the show. Help people find Miami Vice. Go leave a review. I'm not going to lie. Give us five stars, two thumbs up, a high five, whatever the highest review is on your podcast platform of choice. Go ahead and give us that to help people find the show. Also, tell a friend. If you know someone that's in the Miami Vice, tell a friend about this show, Go With The Heat. Tell them to check it out at GoWithTheHeat.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. Thank you.